You've uh, looked at the brains of, um, or information coming from the brain of some of the people that have had UFO encounters. What, what's common about the brain of people who encounter UFOs? So the, the study started with a group of, uh, let's say, a cohort of individuals that were brought to me and their MRIs uh, to ask about the damage that had been seen in these individuals. It turns out that the majority of those patients ended up being, as far as we can tell, Havana syndrome. And so f for me, at least, this, you know, that part of the story ends in terms of the injury. It's likely almost all Havana syndrome. That's somebody else's problem now. That's not my problem. Um, but when we were looking at the brains of these individuals, we noticed something right in the center of the basal ganglia uh, in many of these individuals that at first we thought was damage. It was basically uh, an enriched patch of MRI dense uh, neurons that we thought was damage, and it, but then it was showing up in everybody, and then we looked and we said, oh, it's actually not. The other readings on these MRIs show that actually that's living tissue. Um, that's actually in the head of the caudate and the patamen. Um, and at the time, and I remember even asking a good friend of mine uh, at Stanford who is a um, psychiatrist, what does the basal ganglia do? He said, oh, the basal ganglia is just about uh, movement and nerve and motor control. And I said, well, that's odd because, uh, you know, these other papers that we were reading at the time started to suggest that it was involved with uh, higher intelligence and is actually downstream of the executive function uh, and involved with intuition and planning. And if you think about it, if you're going to have motor control, which is centralized in one place, motor control requires knowledge of the environment. You know, you, you don't want to move something and, and hit the table. Or if you're walking across a room, you want to be aware and cognizant of what you might bump into. So obviously, all of that planning is requires access to all the senses. It requires access to your desires, memory, knowledge of where and what you want and desire to walk near or by. Like I use the example of you're at a party, you want to avoid that person, you like that person, the waiter's about to drop something. All without thinking, you maneuver. So that actually, all that planning is done in the basal ganglia. Um, and it's actually now called the brain within the brain. It's a, it's a goal processing system subservient to executive function. So what we think we found there was not something which allows people to talk to UFOs. I mean, I think the UFO community uh, took it a step too far. What I think we found was a form of higher functioning and processing. So what we then looked at, and this was the most fascinating part of it, we, we looked then at individuals in the families of those, uh, let's say the index case individuals, and we found that it was actually in families. Hmm. And more so, this is the most fascinating part, we've probably looked now at about 200 just random cases that you can download off of databases online. You don't see this higher connectivity. You only find it in what Kit Green would have called or has called higher functioning individuals, people who are, uh, I mean, he, he called them savants. I, I don't have the means to, uh, we haven't done the testing, but as it turns out, my family has it, right? We, we found it in, in me, my brother, my sister, my mother. We found it as well in other individuals, husband and wife pairs. So statistically, if you had a group of 20 individuals and you found two husband-wife pairs, both of whom had it, and yet it's only found at about, we think, one in 200, one in 300 individuals, the fact that two individuals came together, two sets of individuals came together, both of whom had it, implied either a restricted breeding group mm -hmm. or attraction. The reason why it seems to be in, let's say, so-called experiencers or people who claim, if, if intuition is the ability to see something that other people don't, and I don't mean that in a paranormal sense, but being able to see something that's in front of you that other people might just dismiss, well, maybe that's 
a function of a higher kind of intelligence to say, well, I, I'm not looking at an artifact. I'm not looking at something that I should just ignore. I'm seeing something and I recognize it for not what it is, but that it is something different than is normally found in my environment. Yeah, you know, I have a, a little bit of that. I, I seem to uh, see the magic in a lot of moments. Like I have a deep, uh, it's obviously, not obviously, but it seems to be chemical in nature that I just am excited about life. I, I love life. I love like stupid things. It feels like I'm high a lot <laughs> uh, on like mushrooms or something like that, where you'd really appreciate that. So I'm, you're able, I'm able to detect something about the environment that uh, maybe others don't, I don't know, but mm -hmm. like I seem to be over the top grateful to be alive on a lot of, for a lot of stupid reasons. And that's in there somewhere. I mean, it, it's kind of interesting because um, it, it really is true that our brains, the way we're brought up, but also the genetics enables us to see certain slices of the world. And, um, some people are probably more receptive to anomalous information. They see the they see the magic, the possibility in the novel thing, right? As opposed to kind of uh, finding the pattern of the common of the regular. Some people are more. Wait a minute, this is kind of weird. I mean, a lot of those people probably become scientists too. Like, huh? Hmm. Like. There's this pattern happening over and over and over, and then something weird just happened. And then you get excited by that weirdness and start to pull the string and discover what is at the core of that weirdness. Right. And perhaps is that, you know, maybe by way of question, how does the human perception system deal with anomalous information? Do you think? Well, it first tries to classify it and get it out of the way. If it's not food, if it's not sex, right? If it's not uh, in the way of my desires, or if it is in the way of my desires, then you focus on it. And so the I think the question is how much spare processing power, how much CPU cycles do we spend on things that are not those core desires.